I don't know. Should we just start? Just the two of us? We can make it if we try. Just the two of us. Me and you Brett. And, uh... Welcome, everybody, this week to the Damage Per Second Podcast. It's week 35. Is that? I think that's right. Yeah, 35. The reason I question is because 35 is such a nice number. It's a multiple of five and seven. Think about that. Seven oh, is the I'm number of God. It. Is that... Is it six is the number of the devil? Is seven... No, seven was just the day that he rested. And this is only in the... In the Christian in, Bible. I take it back. This is getting off topic. Baby. What in God's name are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it's hard work coming up with weird number facts every week, okay? Sometimes you can't <laughs> land them all. You just can't land every single one. Sometimes they're bad. And not well contrived. All right. So I'm here with Brett and Keith, co host with the Comos Keith and special guest star Brett. Introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Brett. I'm Lil Mookie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Keith, start us out this week as we do our standard what we've been doing, what we've been playing, what we've been enjoying this week. <clears throat> well, I, uh, I've been playing some Witch 3 and Skellige, trying to feel that place out. You know, the second, sort of the second half of the game, I guess. Um, Although I guess not really, because there's a bunch of DLC too. But uh, that's that's pretty cool. I haven't gotten too deep into that. I will say that uh, it's you can really kind of get like you know there's a couple romance options. I mean, like mainly two, and it's really unclear when you get screwed out of the first one. Like I mean, or when you know you answer something that you wouldn't. It seems fairly innocuous, and it like okay, I guess you can't romance this character anymore, and you only have this other option who I don't particularly like, but. I guess there's another one in the DLC. Uh, there's been... Uh, I've been doing some uh, Rocket League and some Overwatch on PS4 because I'm on vacation. I have a PS4 here, but not my PC. Um, that's been pretty fun. Uh, there's a lot of like little kids here, so it's also fun like, you know, having to... Stop play, you know, stop playing Overwatch like really suddenly because you're like, oh, it's like five year, you know, there's like a bunch of five and under kids, and you know, it's like cartoony, but it's still like a shooter. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. someone's parents so, yeah. are just gonna be like, yeah. oh, what's this? What's what? What? What is my child having to witness? Yeah, sir. <laughs> Pretty much, <laughs> and uh, so there's some of that, and then, uh, um, but it, it's been going well, and you know, the internet here isn't great huge house here um but like you know so at first i put it down it was like a theater downstairs but the internet speed was like abysmal and it was impossible to do anything um so i moved it upstairs but obviously that gets a lot more traffic um i just noticed apparently a couple hours ago blizzard revealed their new the new overwatch map eichenwald uh Ooh. so i'm pretty excited about that i don't know when they're releasing <laughs> <laughs> they they announced so much stuff. They announced so much stuff today. I'm real excited to talk about it. And uh, they, um, I don't know. It, so so that's pretty cool because I mean I haven't seen the even seen the trailer for it yet. I just saw this, but I kind of expected it because uh, all the a lot of the characters have um, maps where they're kind of from. So Lee Jung Towers, you know, your May. Uh, Hanna Murray got Genji and Hanzo. Volskaya Industry is um, what's her face, Saria, and I mean Dorado is McCree. I mean you got, you just got maps that are associated with everybody. Kings Rose Tracer. Uh, but then I realized like, wait, so we got Reinhardt and Mercy, and we don't have any. I mean we don't have any German themed maps. Uh, and then this one came about. I mean sure, there's other people like. You know, Roadhog and Junkrat don't really have something exclusively devoted to them, but uh, that's kind of neat. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it'll be interesting to check out that map because that's one thing people have been saying is, well, they need, I mean, they need more maps. They don't have that many, uh, six or something. I mean, six locales, and then they some of them have like several maps per if they're like a capture point kind of map mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's pretty cool i'm excited about that i don't know when they're gonna release it they announced a ton of changes to the uh to the test realm um and then eventually gonna move into uh production server 
the uh, especially concerning their com- uh, competitive mode season two. They're fixing a ton of problems that people had with it, making matches shorter, reducing kind of cheese stuff, you know. Thing. I mean, cheesy strategies and stuff like that and making things more fair, uh, less sudden, you know, no sudden death anymore. So um, hopefully these will make competitive matches a lot faster, more stomachable. And I'm really excited that they introduced the, uh, you know, Blizzard's uh, classic system. I mean, I don't know if they're the first to do it, but... You know, silver, gold, bronze league, silver league, gold league, diamond, master, uh, platinum, whatever, and grandmaster. Because that's really exciting. I mean, I don't know. It, it just feels a lot better. Like when you go up in a league, um, and and they make it a little bit harder to drop down after you increase into a league. So like, you know, once you're in this league. You don't have to worry about, oh, well, I'm going to get knocked out of this league and I'm not going to get credit for it, uh, which is kind of an interesting way to do it because you'd think, of, I mean, only a certain number of people can be up in these higher tiers, but yeah. I'm sure they figured out a way to do it. So I'm, I'm just excited to play it. I'm excited to uh, see how it works. Blizzard is, I mean, I don't know if you guys have noticed, uh, so they announced that for Overwatch. They announced so much stuff today. They announced for Heroes of the Storm, they're going to add Alarak as a playable character mm. with a, and, and a new map for Heroes of the Storm that's StarCraft-based. Mm. Um, and they announced all of these really cool StarCraft uh, changes. So Alarak is going to be a StarCraft II co-op commander, which I think everybody was really excited about because everybody seems to like Alarak. And they announced... So this happened a couple days ago, but there's enormous multiplayer changes coming. And by enormous, I mean, it depends on how you would classify that. But I would say it's enough to count as its own expansion in terms of multiplayer. Like, the the types of changes they're proposing is what you would see other than... I mean, there's no additional... There's no new units, but the types of, like, major changes that are going to... The way that they're going to affect multiplayer is the the types of changes you saw between Heart of the Swarm and Legacy of the Void and things like that. Like, it's, it's huge... And so the amount of support that they're putting into StarCraft II, which is arguably their least played game, is really astounding. So, like, I, I have to give yeah. Blizzard props. I mean, I know not everybody agrees all the time, but they have really impressed me lately with this support for all of their games. I think Overwatch has almost has sort of reinvigorated them to really compete as a major developer. And not just in a, like, a, we make good games, but in a, we support our games and we support our viewer base and we listen to our viewer base. It's, I'm just like, I'm really impressed with them. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Well, the, oh, yeah, and, post and, the trailer in the chat for uh, the new Overwatch map. Cool. And I wanted to ask you, because you brought up Rocket League, and that seems like a game that it's good to play when you're traveling, and it's just sort of easy to yeah. pick up. How uh, how does that game holding up? Is it still... Hell yeah. I still play it constantly. Really? Oh, yeah. That game's awesome, man. It's, it's just, super... They, I don't know what it is about it, but it just works. It's super fun. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a super fun game. It's easy to pick up and, and play. It holds up. It's not. It's definitely a casual game, I think. It could be pro for some people, I'm sure, but uh, it's yeah, definitely it's... easy to, you know, you take on a trip and you just play it a little bit more, and uh, it's, you know, couch co-op, which is great. It's accessible to anybody, like a little kid can come play it, and, uh, you know, it's difficult for mean people to say swear words or whatever you're concerned about, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. um, I don't know, it's a super accessible game, it's just, uh, it's pretty pure fun. I would never get into it like super hardcore, like I'm going to go and I'm going to play every single day and work to get super good. I'm sure some people would, but it's nice because less and less games sort of fit into that area. I, I mean, that's how I think of Binding of Isaac or something like that. Maybe not in the accessibility way, but like it's super easy to just sit down and play at any given time. I'm not going to, you know, play it every single day for, you know, several games, but. Uh, it's always fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I tried it once when I was over at your place when we get we came back from our little vacation, our little outing, and I I enjoyed it. It just it definitely seemed like one of those games that's fairly easy to pick up, but really hard to master, which I think makes for a really good uh, a really good really good longevity for a game, especially a multiplayer yeah. game. Yeah, definitely. 
makes it easy to just keep playing it because yeah. you just want to feel yourself getting better and you want to win and it's yeah it's a good formula it's still not something i think that i am going to ever play more of though <laughs> admittedly i think the matchmaking is pretty good like i feel like it's pretty even games that i lose and games that i win and it's pretty rare that i it's pretty rare that i get absolutely blown out and just feel terrible about myself <laughs> Don't feel terrible about yourself. <laughs> yeah, I feel this. I mean, that's that's kind of how I play multiplayer, though, too, is, is like if I ever feel that way, I, I just stop. Like, I don't keep bashing my head against the wall. So finding a game where when you do lose, you're like, eh, that's fine. <laughs> is, is the right is the right choice. Yep. 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 I've been playing a lot of Diablo. Mm. And... It's because Season 7 started, and as usual, I feel like I'm really late to the punch with being like, oh, I found this game, it's really fun, and it's like six years old. <laughs> Diablo is a little newer than that, but still. Um, I don't know. I don't know how old it is these days, but I, I, uh, I'm actually liking it a lot, um, way more than I expected to, um, because I, I just thought I'd pick it up, and it's just, it's the perfect game, like I was telling you, Brett, earlier, was it's the perfect game that you don't have to pay much attention to but it, you know you can sit down and you like you you change your gear up and you change your build up so you put in that little bit of attention and suddenly the game just gets like way more fun because you're just smashing through enemies that like way better so you like you can pay attention at times for like huge enjoyment increases i should say but for the most part i don't have to pay attention while i'm actually playing which is why i kind of like podcasting with this game because like m even starcraft co-op i have to pay some sort of attention to unless i lower the difficulty significant significantly so i can i can much much more easily pay attention to what's happening on the stream in, during yeah. the podcast yeah so i literally just i run around and i stop and i hold down a button and shoot out a big laser <laughs> ray and I don't, I don't have to, I don't, just don't, it doesn't matter what happens. Like, I, I might die, but the consequences are so negligible because I'm not playing on hardcore either right now. It's just like, I don't know, it's just a great game. It's mindless fun. It's like for people who kind of like to grind, but you actually see it pay off. I think, it's a, I think it's a good game, and I think the game's in a really good state in terms of, um, I don't want to say balance because it's, it's, mo it's single player, but it's in, in terms of balance how they've uh, introduced some new sets with the Season 7 and all of the, the little tweaks they've made. I think all of the classes are in a really good spot, and they're all really fun to play. So I'd recommend it. You know, if you used to like Diablo and you're just looking for something casual to play, that's probably, in my opinion, it's worth picking up if you just want to put in a couple hours and give it a shot, see if you like the new season. Yeah, it really takes me a lot to get back into that game to the point where I want to start a character, like, at the bottom level. Yeah. Keep going. It's... Not, I don't know, the, the new season stuff doesn't really motivate me because I feel like I've never actually gotten far enough into a season where it's like I see the benefits of it. Yeah, see, I anything. finally at that point. So I, it's it's like uh, way, yeah. like once you start at 70, that's just like the start of the game. And I, I could power level you if you want to do it. But, you know, you could get power leveled and then you can enjoy like hunting down for certain legendaries and getting just the right set. Just and you see like an astronomical damage boost is so fun. Yeah, those numbers are addicting. Yep. <laughs> like, being able to kill enemies really, really fast as you up the difficulty so that you can get better gear to kill enemies faster on a higher difficulty still. It's just like, it, when you think about it, it's just, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. What, what is any game, though, when you, when you put it like that? Uh, it's like, what's the, it's just a progression system. And it's a really well done progression system, in my opinion. So that's why, you know, I think Blizzard's always done pretty well with these types of progression <clears throat> systems. Yeah, for sure. Faux show. Yeah. Um, I've been doing or something show. else this week. What was it? Uh, I am really excited about the, the co-op changes for StarCraft. I know I already brought this up, but I think um, they're, they're still supporting <clears throat> it, and they I think they they just keep admitting, like, they keep talking about it like it's, a, like it's still a surprise. Like, wow, I can't believe how well co-op's been doing. I can't believe how many people like this mode. Like, they put out a new, they put out a new <laughs> video today of, like, co-op's been hugely successful, so here's a new introductory video to explain what the mode is. And I don't know why they did that, to be honest, because they, they, they didn't announce anything with it. They just were like, this is co-op. Here's how you play it again. But I think even they're really shocked at how much people like it. And my theory is because 
I think their fan base for StarCraft is a little bit older because a lot of them are carryovers from the original StarCraft. So you have a lot of people around our age, maybe even in their early 30s, who come home from work and they don't want a stressful ladder match. So that's why they've seen I, that the campaign is the main draw for people to buy the game and, and the co-op is the biggest draw for people to keep playing the game, not the multiplayer, not the, uh, not the laddering, I suppose. So I really think maybe their age demographic has to do with that, but I'm not really sure. That's my theory. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty interesting evolution of that game. Yeah, it's, it's very strange. When it came out with Wings of Liberty, many would say it was in a really good spot, but uh, it just... I'm, I'm not sure if it was back at the time when Blizzard just wasn't really willing to make quick changes and try new things and listen to their to their fan base as much. They basically just said, here's StarCraft II, here's what you wanted. Okay, you've got it now. The end, for the most part. And then they just were like, okay, we're going to work on Heart of the Swarm, and in two years, we'll fix everything that people don't like. But two years is is more than enough time for people to lose interest completely, especially with MOBAs becoming as popular as they did. And they just did not adapt. And now they're finally adapting, and I think it was for the first time, for the first time in many years has uh, some of the StarCraft II prize pools gone up. Oh, so that's, awesome. that's exciting to see. Yeah, that is awesome. It'd be really cool to see StarCraft take off again. It's such a fun game to watch, I think. I really enjoy watching it. It's very, very, it's very fast-paced. I mean, so is MOBAs. It's just really, really, really fast-paced, and it's also because I understand the game better than I do professional Dota. Like, I, I know Dota, but I feel like when I watch professional Dota, I just don't it's just, like, way too fast for me to understand. Like, so much is happening, and I just, like... Yeah. And then the commentator starts screaming. I'm like, what What? What happened? They're just, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, just like... Ah! <laughs> I mean, it's like everybody can tell something's happening. Something exciting. Yeah. And I can't say that StarCraft is more, uh, more accessible to watch than Dota or League, but... I, uh, for me personally, I, I just really, I just think it's, it's a fast paced game that I'm able to follow personally. So I don't know from Brett, you've, you've watched a little bit. Did you, were you able to kind of oh, yeah. follow what was happening in those? In Dota or Starcraft? In Starcraft. Sorry. Uh, here and there. I mean, the little bit that I played made it pretty easy to understand what was going on, what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it really wasn't that difficult. I think the, the learning curve is when you learn the game, you only learn it from your perspective and then the. When you watch it, you see the spectator's perspective, and so you don't, I don't know, you don't, you're missing a lot of, like, the actions that they're doing and stuff. Yeah, that's but true. I, feel, I mean, that might be even more confusing for somebody that's newer to it, but I feel like me personally, when I'm seeing it from, like, a spectator point of view, it just, sometimes it'll just kind of confuse me because they move around so quickly around to all the different teams and, or whatever, you know, the different players, I mean to say. Yeah. So. Well, speaking of that, as Brett, mm -hmm. you can transition into what you've been doing but the international finals yeah the international was hands down the best dota tournament that's ever taken place it was unbelievable i think four heroes were not picked out of the entire 110 hero pool that's incredible something like that which is just it really is a testament to where the the meta is right now to say that it's just very very well balanced and there are many viable strategies as i was saying last week and uh, so the winning team was Wings Gaming. I think they are, uh, I want to say that they're a Chinese team. I should probably Yeah, they're Chinese. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're a Chinese team, and they beat out, <clears throat> I think they came from the upper bracket, so they didn't really fight too hard for that victory, but they still did an amazing job. Like, they're really well known for just their ridiculously unconventional drafts. They drafted, like, Pudge and Techies, which is, <laughs> Techies is, like, a totally unused hero mainly and he plants mines and so the idea was pudge would take the hook and hook enemy heroes and then drag them into the mines and apparent i don't know if they won or lost that match but that's just an example of like the ridiculous stuff that they would pull and it was just a ton of fun to watch and i was pretty upset that the the uh north american team didn't win because they were in the grand finals uh digital chaos that i don't think they were expected to get that far at all but man, what a what a great! It it just like is a real testament to how awesome that game is, and like and what a good place it's in right now. Even though I'm not gonna play it anymore, but <laughs> you know, it's it really is quite well designed. You have to appreciate that at least. Oh yeah, 
They've done, uh, just from what I've seen, it seems like they've made huge leaps and bounds. They're never going to fix the community, but no. they've just made enormous leaps and bounds with how that game is balanced. It's really impressive. Yep, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time watching that. I was up till like, you know, like 1 a.m. watching it every night. It was really exciting to see. It was fun to root for a lot of the teams that I liked were making it through, which did not happen last year. So that was nice. Um, I have a question, gonna... actually, about maybe you will, you will know this because you're way more familiar with the Dota 2 pro scene. So I, I know that the Chinese scene is huge. So I would consider the Chinese scene in MOBAs to be comparable to the Korean scene of StarCraft. So yeah. in StarCraft, you're either Korean or you're a foreigner. So everyone outside <laughs> of Korea is the for are foreigners. They're, they are the foreign scene. And generally, and Blizzard actually had to split them out and make separate leagues for them, basically. Oh, wow. Because people couldn't compete, and they felt that it would, it would increase viewership if they had foreigners in their own sets of tournaments because Koreans were always winning, and they felt that their main <laughs> audience which is, you know, their main audience in North America and Europe were losing interest because they, they didn't follow these Korean players as much, which I don't think is necessarily true, and I don't yeah. necessarily agree with their, you know, reasoning to split them out, but the skill difference is certainly noticeable. I, I'm curious, is the, is the Chinese scene similar in Dota? Um, I think when the game was starting out, they were known as, like, the powerhouses because the first international was was like, I mean, you can watch um, free-to-play, and it gives you a lot of the background on sort of like how they were just like the the secret final boss, the Chinese, because all the tournaments <laughs> were just local things. You know, people weren't traveling country to country to play video games at that point. Um, and I, I actually don't really remember the outcome of the first international, so I can't really comment on how China did, but there are a lot of really strong Chinese teams. But I think one of the cool things about competitive Dota is just how diverse it is. And like, you know, you've got teams from Finland, you've got teams from anywhere in Europe, you've got teams from North America, and... It's like the Olympics! Yeah, I mean, I mean, really, it, it kind of is like that a little bit, you know, especially when it comes down to a point where... Well, I mean, I'd say most people that follow Dota esports follow players over teams, you know? And so it got to a point for me where I didn't really follow any of the players that were in the Grand Finals, so I was basically just rooting North America versus China, you know? Yeah. And and uh, the North American team was in the lower bracket, and they fought another North American team who came in third, Evil Geniuses. So, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say they're like any, they're on any different level. The mm -hmm. Chinese players, it's a, they're pretty evenly uh, placed. And I think that, um, I think Ice Frog, the main developer behind Dota Two, Dota Two, takes into account the sort of different play styles that happen in each country. You know, because Chinese Dota is very farming oriented and, uh, you know, they spend most of the time waiting for your main carries to get up to like six item slots so you can just go and win really quick uh, right at like the 45 minute mark or something. And then there's North American Dota, which totally throws Chinese Dota for a loop because they're not used to that style of, you know, just farming like the North Americans will just go crazy from like minute one. They're just getting tons of kills and not worrying about farming. Just like, you know, it's a totally different style of play. So like, the, I think the game's environment just promotes that. Like, you know, that any style will work. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of why I think that no particular region or like dominates the game too. So, yeah. Cool, that's cool pretty game. interesting. Like the cultural differences between I mean, yeah. how people play the game. That's cool. Yeah, definitely. Sweet. Oh, I, yeah. Um, I also played No Man's Sky. <laughs> yes, this is what I wanted to talk Ooh, about. <laughs> I want to hear more about, yeah, I want to hear more about No Man's Sky. Yeah, man. So right after our podcast, I was doing some research, and I, I watched a clip. Uh, uh, that might have been the day of. I was watching the Giant Bomb Quick Look, and I thought it looked pretty good in general. And so I was like, ah, oh, you know what? I got to be a part of this. Everybody's hyping about it. I was like reading on NeoGAF. People are loving it. They're like booting it up and it's amazing. And I did the same thing. So I, I got it digitally and I booted it up and it, it's freaking awesome. You know, you're, you're stranded on this, uh, this random planet in who knows where with your broken ship. And so they don't really tell you exactly what you're supposed to do. So I just started try to, like shooting rocks. 
And I kind of figured out, like, oh, I need to fuel this up and fuel this up and get, like, some carbon for this thing to repair and whatever. And, uh... So once I finally fixed my ship and got out of space, or out of the planet and into space, I thought it was really, really awesome. It's like it's like pretty breathtaking to go out of a planet into the atmosphere, into space, and like just see all the other planets that are around you. Um, and so you know you just kind of do some exploring, and it gives you 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 look at your map once you get a warp drive, which allows you to go from different galaxies and whatever, because you basically the exploration takes place in different galaxies. It's not like it's not like you're going to see like 90 planets in a distance when you're in a particular area because you need to use the warp drive, which is essentially just fast traveling to a different galaxy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you go planet to planet in these particular galaxies and there's no real reason to stop at every planet, but you get to discover them and name them and stuff and you get extra credits for that, which you, you just get credits out of the wazoo. And you, you stop on a planet, you find a base, and maybe they'll give you a waypoint for, like, a abandoned ship or, or like, a, a special thing where you can learn the language of this planet or something. Like, they teach you word by word the languages. Huh. And so then I get off that planet, and I go to a different planet, and I find a waypoint, and it points me in the direction of a language thing and then I might find somebody they'll talk to and they'll teach me a word from the language and maybe I'll find like a guy who wants to trade me something for a new gun and so I think I'm like basically just kind of working my way towards the center of the universe and I'm not really sure why or why I should care but I just keep landing on planets and finding waypoints and farming minerals that I don't need and my inventory keeps filling and my ship's inventory keeps filling and man, I, that game is a chore. <laughs> like, Ugh. the wonder no. of it all really goes away really, really quickly. <laughs> oh, that's such a shame. That's what I was gonna ask Sorry about. I haven't played the game since like since Wednesday, I think. How many hours do you think you put into it before you were sick of it? Uh, maybe like I think I maybe put like eight hours into it or something. Okay. It's a really interesting game. And I'm, like, glad that I got to experience what I experienced. But, like, I just cannot bring myself to play that game again. <laughs> because uh. it's just kind of boring. You know, there's just not a ton to do. And that's mainly most people's mm. complaints is, like, there's just really not a ton to do. You know, I got the impression that, remember, it, it was marketed as, a, as a, like, strictly an exploration game. And everyone was like, oh, my God, the exploration's crazy. And then they started talking about the survival. And I can't, I wonder if maybe... They added the survival aspect to it later just to kind of compensate for the fact yeah. that... That there was the only that, exploration. Yeah, they, they realized they're like, people aren't going to want to play this for too long. And one of my friends at work today, I, you know, said I found kind of insightful about the game, especially, you know, in reference to what you've been saying, is the game kind of seems like Minecraft, but there's no progression. Yeah. Whereas at least in Minecraft, there's like some semblance of a progression system. Yeah, so um, and, you can't and I build mean, anything. I was under the impression that I would be like building my own ship and stuff like that. But all it is is you get the one ship that you start with, and when you craft a new part to your ship, it's just like a block in the ship's inventory that you fill up with fuel. Like nothing aesthetically changes. You don't really do anything aesthetically at all in terms of customization or ship stuff. And so you can like offer to buy other ships. Because you, you'll stop at a space station, and that's where you can, like, sell things. And then you can also, um, like I said, you can offer to buy other ships. And you just switch over your inventory, and that's it. And then that's your ship. <laughs> and you can't do anything to that new ship either. So, I don't know. I'm just I'm just finding difficulty to, uh, to get myself back in. I don't think there's a really good reason to just keep playing it. Which is a shame, because it's a really, really cool game but there's just nothing there's I, nothing to it i kind of want to point out though because i know a lot of people are going to want to say see it was so overhyped <laughs> and i yeah. will give you that yes it was but well, a lot of people were skeptical too well yeah but i was skeptical I just, but what i think it's just i think people 
overhyped it for being more than it was, but honestly, I, just because it might get boring, I think that it is incredible for what it is. That doesn't mean oh, that it's yeah. a great game, but I think that for what they were advertising, I think they delivered what they advertised on, and it's, it's entirely some players' faults for hyping it up. I don't think yeah. that they under-delivered like, something like Spore. Yeah, uh, I don't know. There's this whole thread on Reddit of things that were promised for No Man's Sky and then like video proof of them promising it and then <laughs> just not. I mean, I should link this to you guys, but it's long. It is That's one long bad. ass list and it's it's well, true. Like the whole multiplayer thing, they were extremely weird about multiplayer. They were never and they did say in some cases that there was multiplayer and then those two people ended up on the same planet and then couldn't even see each other. And so nobody yeah. really knows what's going on with the whole multiplayer thing. That to me, that that to me in particular is the thing that I'm like. That seems like a straight up lie. Yeah, like, yeah. They didn't. I mean, I'm sure they intended for there to be multiplayer. I don't know if they intended to get it in in a really early patch, but they were so cagey about it, but didn't want to take the wind out of people's sails, like right before the game came out. So they refused to straight up say you cannot <clears throat> play with other people. It does not require a PS Plus subscription. That oh, the chances are so low that you're going to find anyone. Like all this stuff, they refuse to come out and say you can't do it. And even after yeah. it came out, he's like saying stuff on Twitter. Like he's people tweeted at him, and he's like, "Oh wow, I can't believe people managed to find each other like already. Like wow, it's a testament to the community." Blah blah blah. Like just what seemed like a total meltdown. Like you know. Like, <laughs> Oh my god, oh my god, I'm panicking, you know. Yeah, so I'm eating my words from last week about people never, probably never going to find each other. But one sentiment that I will still stick to is, I just I just don't think that there's, it doesn't matter whether people can see each other or not, because it's not what the game yeah. is. So yeah. I, yeah. I remember seeing that, like, two people were on the same planet and they couldn't see each other. You know, huge, you know, all caps shitty clickbait kotaku article and i just think like but like why why yeah. do people care about that like that's not what the game is because yeah. th i mean even if there was multiplayer in the sense that they could see each other there's no there was nothing advertised in the game that said that people would be able to interact with each other even if they could see each other like they were cagey about it but one thing that is for sure is they never said but if you do find someone you can do all this cool stuff so i don't yeah. know what people expected well, I, I think that the game has a ton of potential. Um, yeah. I agree with uh, the, the fact that, like what you said, where um, I bet it was added after the fact because they were afraid there wasn't enough gameplay. But the problem is, what this game is as aspiring to be, I believe, is a lot... I mean, the, the appeal of this game is similar to the appeal of Minecraft. Yeah. But where they fall short is... Like, the exploration is incredible in this game. It's better than mine. I mean, it, it, it definitely has a potential to be better than Minecraft. That's where they shine. But you're, then they added a bunch of things like gameplay elements. I mean, Minecraft, there's not I don't know necessarily if it's better than Minecraft for exploration. Well, I'm saying, I'm saying just, like, purely, like graphics-wise and the animals. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, the procedurally generated... and. and engine not engine you know what i'm talking about the the, proce the procedural generation is way more dynamic than minecraft it's, it's, it's way more advanced so you you could see it being significantly better the fact that there's like you can explore by ship and you can explore by land and, and just you know the planets are different stuff like that it has the potential to be better than minecraft but the problem is they and, and i know minecraft has certain elements like hunger and like whatever but in your life but it seems like a lot of these things, like they added a bunch of survival mechanics that are more like sticks and not like carrots. And I think what you really want here is carrots, like encouraging people, complete this task, and you'll get something new. We'll give you something. And stuff like getting off the planet, you know, you repair your ship, you get off the planet, and now you can go into hyperspace, you, you, your warp drive. That stuff's great. That's what everything else should be like, not chores oh crap i gotta refill my thing i gotta refill all my meters or else i'll die you know <laughs> like there could yeah. be a little bit of that but stuff is something like that's more fun when it's combat not when it's 
you know, oh, I just have to do that. I mean, I just have to get more. I can't do anything fun, and it's it's like the stuff out of mobile games. Like, oh, I can't do fun stuff anymore until I refill all my meters. Like yeah. everybody hates that stuff. Yeah, and I, it's one thing if you're trying to monetize your game using it, but if the intent is for that to be fun, that's well, literally all the game is right now <laughs> for it's me. Not fun. At the point I'm at in the game, all my goals are just to refuel my hyperdrive so I can go to the next galaxy. Yeah. It's like, Jesus. Or whatever build it is. Or things, you know, or you could, I mean, traditionally there's unlocking things. I unlock new weapons. I unlock new suits and costumes, and they're aesthetically different, and they do different things. <laughs> you know, and there's an extent to that, like, oh, I got more fuel. I have more fuel now. Um... There's that kind of bonus, uh, or like finding new loot, like in Borderlands and Diablo, and things that make you feel good in other, you know, big games like that. Um, and then in Minecraft and stuff like that, there's, oh, you can build stuff, so you can work towards something, and it gets better and better and better, and you take some pride in what you've kind of accomplished, and none of those things yeah. are in there. So uh, if it sounds like they did one thing really, 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 really well, and then added some other stuff as an afterthought because they're like, oh, well, shit, we got to make this into kind of a game. <laughs> well, I think that was the issue is it started out as, as an exploration game. And in, what an exploration game does not have generally is a progression system. Mm -hmm. But when they decided to turn, turn it into a survival game, a survival game does need progression. Like yeah. Don't Starve and Minecraft. You need some sort of progression. So it's kind of like yeah, because, yeah, because, the, because the survival part was the afterthought, they never implemented what makes a survival game um, replayable, I suppose. Yeah. Like in Minecraft, you're like, okay, now I have a house, and you know, I have uh, an oven, and I have these other things, so I don't really have to, you know, these things I've been worrying about a ton, I don't really have to worry about them anymore, and I can focus on doing what's important, you know? Yeah. And, I mean... If they had left that survival stuff out, and I and I'm not a fan of that survival stuff in general, I think a small amount of it used very carefully can add some depth to your game. And but most of the time, it's just filler. You know, it's just we need this process to take longer. Yep. So that it's more of a game. <laughs> so you're kind of watering down your game when you add in these. I don't know. In my opinion, that's my opinion. That doesn't mean it's gospel. Uh, but, you know, you're watering down your game when you add in these weird little numbers games where, oh, I have to fill all these meters or else I'm going to lose. Um, so, I, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I think if they left it, I think if they left all of that survival stuff out, you know, the game wouldn't have necessarily been super fun for as long, but... I mean, it sounds like it already isn't, and at least it won't wouldn't be a chore. You know what I mean? <laughs> you would rather people have a good experience with your game and finish it, or get bored of it, I guess, quickly than get annoyed with it and stop because it's a chore. Yeah, and I think they just I think they made a critical error when, you know, the original idea of the game was just look at the procedural generation of this game. It's really dynamic and cool. And I think they just, I think they overreached a little bit and they, they, you know, it's been a top seller. They've made a ton of cash, but I think they, you know, they're going to pay for this now with future sales, unfortunately, unless they add more to this game moving yeah. forward. What I hope is that it's going to be a ongoing project. If you get to the point where, okay, we've added multiplayer, you can play with your friends. We've added building and you can have permanent structures that your friends can see like I say you know make it more like Minecraft there are no other games that are like Minecraft Minecraft's been out for a really long time there's space for and I know a lot of people have tried and failed to do it as well as Minecraft has but I, I don't know you're reaching for some of the same goals and if you're gonna try to make a game that's successful like that that's mostly about exploration then you might want to look to them for some inspiration. Mm -hmm. I hope it's going to be an ongoing project. I hope it's not just over. 
Well, there. I wonder Just... how, okay, so uh, maybe you two, what, what is your opinion on how they could implement multiplayer correctly in this game? Because my concern is if it's too much like Minecraft and you get these huge modded servers where you have hundreds of people, I think multiplayer done right in this game would consist of a small, small group of people and not like the ability to turn into like Eve where you have these big fleets of people out, you know, allying with each other. Yeah. Just, just let your friends come and hang out with you, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I mean, the game as it stands, I would not understand how multiplayer would even work. All you do is drill rocks and get materials <laughs> and put them on your ship. Like, there's literally no multiplayer aspect of it. Yeah, there's like nothing so, to do with your. I mean, your friends could be there, but there's nothing to do with them. Yeah. So. Sounds yeah, like I step mean, one is add a crafting system. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's all these materials, and I was, I just am shocked that there's no like base building stuff because the amount of plutonium and carbon that I collect, and I feel like weird selling it. I don't know what to sell because I don't know what any of the shit means. Like, okay, I got Thamium 9. I have nine batches of it, which is probably like 4,000 Thamium 9. But I need it to fuel my ship, but I have nothing else to do with it. <laughs> so, like, I, I don't know. They need to work more on, like, uses of stuff. They need I'm, to just add stuff to it. <laughs> I don't want to be an asshole about this, because I believe you before, you know, but just being devil's advocate, are you sure that that wouldn't be used for something later in the game? Maybe, but probably just fueling something. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, it would be used to fuel something because at this point, that's all that the materials are used for is either to sell or free fueling. Yeah. As far as I can tell, you can craft certain things, but that's also you're making things to be fueled. So I don't know. It's a confusing little thing that they've got going on. I think base building would be sick, though. I'm, I mean, honestly, that would probably change my whole outlook on the game because that's just, you know, just makes sense yeah. in a survival game. You just know what would place, be cool? Have a place you can call home. Right. You know what would be way more different than Minecraft is, have you guys ever heard of, uh, of Homeworld? The really? game Homeworld? So it was an RTS back made by Sierra, and the, the idea was you, you were oh. a refugee fleet, and every mission that you went to, your fleet from the previous map carried over exactly how it was. Mm. So like something like that, where it's not that you're building a base on planets, you're not making little outposts, but you are, you are making a small automated fleet that can follow you around, and you can get to bigger and bigger ships that could be automated, or maybe you get to a point where you need another person. Never to the point where it's like, over 10 or something but you can make a little convoy of ships that can follow you and you can go to a planet and you can assign little robots to mine things for you so that you can make bigger ships to just expand like that which allows you to move quicker and quicker towards your ultimate goal something like that could be really fun yeah yeah i would if they added pretty much anything to that game at this point i would be <laughs> down with it it's what? really a shame when you, I feel this so, way. What, what, what is it like? So you learn the alien language and they you talk to them. What is. Well, what do so they basically, say? my only interaction where language helped me was you know, they'll say something about like one of your guns or something. This guy would be like, hey, blah, 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 like, blah, 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 gun. And so you kind of just deduce, like, oh, this guy likes my gun. <laughs> so you just hand <laughs> <read> it over. <laughs> and then. And then he, uh, he kicks you in the gives nuts. you a new gun or something like, and that's and also I should also add that like, getting new stuff is just totally random, like you don't know if the planet that you're going on is gonna have like a new ship or a new gun or new whatever, because the gun I had to start with was awful and I was lucky enough to find just some random guy who had one, because he said <laughs> something like what I had said as an example of their language, so. Yeah, that's pretty much all that the language is used for, is for communicating with the random aliens that you come across. Ah, uh, that's... And it's not very varied, either. I feel like the interactions are usually pretty cookie-cutter. That's too bad. Yeah, like, they... Even it... Even, maybe a progression system, even a mild one, but, like, a collection. Like, a collection system would be seemingly better than this. Ugh. It reminds it's just, me of Pokemon Go, something that's like really, really cool, but then after after the first week, yeah. it's like, all right, I guess we're done with this now. It's all this yeah. early access stuff, you know? It's just exactly this game seems like an early access game. Like I've played early access games, and this would be one of them easily. 
Uh, the... I wonder if they suffered from. So Sony held so, yeah. just the hype. Like they, they were like, "Well, we'll advertise the shit out of this game because we need." I mean, if you put it out on our console first, we'll yeah, we'll do that. And I wonder if there was pressure to meet release dates or certain expectations uh, because of what Sony did for them. Um, they're like, "Yeah, you can't. I mean, you can't be pushing back." things on our console you gotta you know deliver so I, I don't know I wonder if there was some of that um, it's just you know it, it just it had such like potential so it's disappointing there's two directions they could go with it they could make it more like like a sandbox they could make it more like a sandbox and add more elements that make a complete game like Minecraft or they could make it more of a single player experience but it sounds like as it stands right now, it's not really either. Yeah. It's like a sandbox. It's like half a sandbox masquerading as a single player experience. Yeah. I mean, I should say that I think the game's really cool at what it does. And I love the space exploration. I think that that's a really neat feature to be able to be flying within asteroids and then all of a sudden you can land on a planet. That's awesome. It just yeah. needs a little more uh, substance yeah. to to benefit that awesome feature. You know, it's like it can only be so great for having one or two things going for it when the game is just not yeah. there. I think this brings up an interesting topic. I mean, we're we're a little late into it, but we started late, um, and that's you know the idea of early access. And I think I you know I'm of two minds because it definitely takes more work to make a polished game these days. <laughs> You can't just throw something together and, it, I mean, it can either look really, generally if it looks really good, it's going to take much longer to make, right, to polish that kind of stuff. And I think that Keith brings up a good point with how maybe, you know, these developers were indebted to Sony and Sony said, well, you have to have some sort of deadline. And, you know, I, I hate to be devil's advocate on that because maybe Sony set something unreasonable, but there's so many early access games made by small groups that get the money and then they just they get more and more ambitious and then they just they just never release it for years and years and years and years yeah. and years and the only the one good thing you can say about companies like EA and Sony is generally because they're such a big company and they are held accountable to people that aren't just nameless people on a Kickstarter or Steam Greenlight is they will actually deliver something that is pretty much mostly finished not all the time but most of the time and that's what you're going to get from a known company and so, like, I don't think I could really blame Sony for saying, okay, we're going to help you, but you have to actually release this thing. Yeah, you have to release it when you said. Because this I mean, was in development for a long time. I hate to always go back to, like, Ark Survival Evolved as the example, <laughs> but I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but they were on, they were, they were on uh, like, social media and shit telling people, like, oh, we really want to release it on PS4, but they won't let us. They won't. We'd love to get this into your hands as soon as possible on platforms like PS4, but they won't let us release it uh, in early access. So go tell them and campaign for them to let us. And and I was happy to see that like half the comments were people hating on Sony, um, just in general, not really about this. Just like I I don't I don't like Sony and I like Xbox and stuff. But <laughs> but and the rest of them, I, I was happy to see where people saying like. Oh, wait, you mean they won't change their entire fucking ecosystem so that you can release your unfinished game? <laughs> and, oh, boo-hoo, why don't you just finish your game instead of complaining to people on social media? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I appreciated that, because that game, I mean, it's been out forever. Finish it. Yeah, like, I know. Sorry, if you haven't done it yet, you haven't finished it yet, I'm sorry that I don't trust you. I don't trust that once you have everybody's money... I don't trust that you, I mean, you're not incentivized then to actually complete your product to the best of your ability. Yep. And it doesn't help that that game in particular, although I'm getting away from the you know more general example, is made by like a hodgepodge of small companies. So none of them will really be held accountable because it's just contracted out to a bunch of other companies. So even if they you know, never deliver on their promises, it doesn't matter to any of them because no one knows who even made it. Yeah. 
I think so. the right happy medium is, you know, these large companies that can promise things and not deliver, but they generally will at least put something out when they say they will, compared to these smaller groups that maybe never, like, they have a great idea and they have tons of talent and they have, you know, the ability to make a really good game, but it would take them between five and ten years, or never, or just never, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just unfinished. It's, you, we need some sort of in-between, and I don't really know what that is, but we need some sort of incentive for once these people get early access money, they have to actually deliver it, or they have to refund you. And as far as I know, yeah. I don't think there's any sort of policy. It's basically, hey, if you're, I hate to put it this way, but if you're stupid enough to buy something in early access that you're not sure about getting finished, um, too fucking bad. <laughs> yeah. Too bad. Your money's gone, and that's it. And I think it's kind of clear yeah. when you buy early access, you're not going to get that money back, even if the game is not finished. Uh, or they'll just say, like, you know, do the whole mission accomplished banner and be like, yeah, it's all done. You're welcome. <laughs> like, oh, really? Because it seems like it's terrible. It yeah. doesn't work. And they'll get, <laughs> you know, they'll get bad reviews, but they still already have your money. Yeah. I know. That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that, uh, Hello Games isn't just like, oh, well, you know, the critical reception has been pretty mediocre, but we also sold like four million copies in the first week. So we're not really going to do anything because we got our money. We're going to run now. Like Star Wars yeah. Battlefront. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, I wonder what Sony thinks of this. Like, do, they, do you think they care? Obviously, they must be making some money off of this game. Uh, I mean, they probably already made bank. So exactly. they probably so don't like, care. Yeah. It's the motivation. Their to reputation the isn't sold. lost because of this. Yeah. So I guess we'll have to see. I really, I'm really crossing my fingers for some awesome updates because that would feel like a real waste of sixty dollars if that game just sits at where it is right now. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, I think it's it's impressive for what it's done, but yeah. it's not impressive enough, unfortunately. Capture like, the minds yeah. of young Americans. Yeah, I know. Like what what that game has done, in my opinion, is incredible. But that doesn't mean I'm going to pay for it. I think I think that you know they deserve a pat on the back for the idea and the execution, but it needs more to be a game. Yep. And and the funny thing is, like, I'll be the first person to say, like, oh wow, though, like a ten man city, like what an incredible achievement for them. But like, that's not an excuse. Hire more people. Yeah. <laughs> you sold so many copies. But it's then they wouldn't be a ten. Copy. They wouldn't be the humble city. little. Hire more people. Yeah. You don't have an excuse. You don't all need to be freaking multi-millionaires. Contracted out or something. Yeah. Jeez. Hire more people. It's not an excuse anymore. This game's been in development for uh, over two years. Two, over two years now? Like, I mean, way longer than that. Sorry. <laughs> it was announced like several years ago. It just, there's no, I don't know. No, I'm with you. I, uh, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of s small games made by one or two people, and they come out and they're fine. But in a game like this, they overpromised and now are refusing to hire more people. And it's it's kind of more about their reputation. Like if they if they want to maintain their reputation with people, it depends on how it is. Like we're being very critical of it, but there might be a ton of people out there that are like, yeah, it's good enough. That's what that's what I was hoping for. But I don't know. Yeah. I kind of doubt it based on how Brett's been talking about it. Yeah. <sighs> I'm also picky, but I mean, I'm. Sort of, I feel like I'm sort of just echoing the hive mind of most people that have played the game. So. Yeah. Well, you know what? I have to thank you because now I won't buy it until I see if maybe it's going to get updated in some fashion. Yeah, with definitely. more. Yeah, I, I, would, I would be happy to. Through. If they added a crafting system, and if they added a crafting system, I might buy it. If they added a crafting system and multiplayer, I definitely would. I know that's a tall order. Like, that's pretty pretty <laughs> huge. But I think also one limitation they have is, uh, and we don't need to talk about that much, sorry, but uh, one of the limitation they have is that unlike Minecraft, they host their own servers. But, I mean, I think a lot of people would be happy to have it hosted somewhere else if it meant, well, we can have persistent crafting and uh, play with our friends. Yeah, you know, yeah. if, that's, yeah. if that's what it takes, guys, like, yeah, sure, let's do it, you know. Put, or put it on PS Plus and let's let PlayStation host the servers. Or, I mean, if that's what it takes, I think a lot of people would be happy to have that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Oh, well. I'm sure as the, as the days go on, we'll hear more and more about it. But 
I guess, I don't know, I'm always quick to, to jump on something where I know people are wanting and expecting to be disappointed, so that's why I wanted to give it to the benefit of the doubt, but I, it sounds like yeah. I can't. And I trust Brett's opinion more than some some random articles that I read, so I guess that just confirms it. Oh, thank you. Which is too bad. <laughs> thank you very much. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, I want to hear your opinion on this because I think you're going to be an important factor to this because Brett didn't really care when I brought this up. But this is really important to me. <laughs> All right, let's talk about dips. Yes! <laughs> let's talk about spreads and let's talk about I condiments. This is a great anecdote idea. Tara brought this up when we were going to bed last night, and at first I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And then I thought about it, I'm like, you know what? This makes no sense. And I'm actually pretty upset about it. So a dip. All right, we consider ketchup a condiment because you put it on things, right? But very frequently people dip things like french fries in it. Same thing with mayonnaise. Granted, if you dip things into mayonnaise, you're disgusting. I, you know, I'm not afraid to, to say that. <laughs> or whoever does that. But my question to you, Keith, is what makes something a dip? Because just because it's called a dip doesn't mean it's a dip. As we've learned with ketchup, called a condiment, when in fact can be a dip very frequently. It's true. It's certainly not just the mere fact that you dip things into it. We've established that already. All right, if there's going to be a definition for it, I mean, obviously that's a component, but that's not what defines it. And I was talking to my brother about it, <laughs> and he had a good theory. I saw it, and I was like, that's a great point. Like, I was like, <laughs> the first, same situation with you and Tara. I laughed at it. And I was like, wait a sec, that's totally true. <laughs> and, and then I was, uh, and so I started thinking about it, and uh, I asked my brother about it, and he said, you know what it might be, is that with a dip, is a dip always the star of the show, whereas a condiment is only, only modifies the star of the show, like ketchup oh. and fry. Mm. But you, you do dip it good, into the ketchup. That's a good way of looking at it. But if you like spinach artichoke dip, that's that's the prize right there. Like any, you know, what you dip into it is just a vehicle for the dip. I see. That Although makes some a people lot of will sense. say that ketchup might be the star of the show with fries, but I don't know. Ah, uh, I mean, I guess the thing is, you wouldn't eat, you wouldn't be eating that ketchup without the fries, whereas you could very easily eat the fries without the ketchup. Oh. Well, so what about chili cheese fries? That's a topping, right? Yeah, see, that's another one. Is that that's not really a dip, but it's a it's more of a condiment slash topping. But it's not a topping because you wouldn't put it on a pizza or on a like a cracker because it's chili and cheese. That's almost like a it's sauce. Like a topping. Yeah, it's like oh. a topping, but the end result's like the same as oh, if you God. dipped it in the first place. I'm so confused. So I was thinking, like, what makes a spread a spread versus a dip? So like a cheese dip versus a cheese spread. One is usually the spread. I think is a little more viscous, right? Yes. But at the same time, I, so. I feel like crackers are less likely to break when dipping them in just a normal dip as opposed to a chip, which <laughs> is going to break right away. So some might say it has to do with the vehicle, but the vehicle of a dip is usually much thinner than, than a cracker, which you would use a spread. But you're not even dipping the spread. That's the point of it being a spread. You're spreading something on it. And that's another thing is that, so spread, <laughs> you know, like you spread... You know, I mean, it's something that you would spread with a knife. So, like, it, you know, that 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 can make sense. I think I think in most cases. But then that's another thing is that what you you spread things on a cracker, but you like dip crackers into a dip. But I'd say things are most likely to break when you're dipping them and like lifting because there's a lot of torque put onto what you're <laughs> dipping. And that, so that's most likely to dip, and yet we get the most fragile thing dipping, like tortilla chips. Yes. Or potato chips. Those things are dipped into dip, and yet they're the most likely to break. Well, let's talk about vegetable dip, because I think vegetable dip is generally as viscous as a cheese spread. But one is going on vegetables, and one is going on crackers. But they're called different things, but the, I would say the viscosity is about the same. So I wonder if it, I think, Keith, you, you're onto something here. I think it almost entirely has to do with the vehicle that's being used and the intent of the vehicle and whether it's the star of the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Now, would you say that a veggie dip, like a French onion dip or something, you're dipping like a carrot in there, or ranch. What's the star of that? Is it the ranch or is it the carrot? 
probably the ranch, right? I don't know. See, I would say the it's carrot. It's not really maybe. what tastes the best, but the the carrot definitely makes up most of what you're eating. Yeah, that's yeah. See, that's the way to look at it. I would say like, dr- so and dressings. That's another thing. Are dressings are dressings fundamentally used with salads? Because I think like when you have a ranch dip versus a ranch dressing, I think they're they're the same thing. But in one case, it's a dip because you're dipping things into it. The dressing you're you're drizzling on t- atop something. But I think the star of the show, I like. I don't know if a dip dressing spread, what have you, would ever be considered the star. It may be the, you may only enjoy the base food because you have that that addition. But I don't think it could ever. But it's not stand I, alone. I think I agree with you. It's not. It, yeah, yeah. It's exactly. It couldn't stand alone. Mm. Yeah. Whereas, if you. Whereas if you had like a spinach artichoke dip or a guacamole or something like, you know, that doesn't necessarily stand on its own, but that doesn't like, I'll eat it right out of the thing. (laughs) I guess what it comes down to is I'm a little disappointed at the colloquial uses of these words that aren't really well defined, you know, because who made ketchup and on the, on the ketchup bottle, it probably claims that it's a condiment, but who is really to say that that's, that it's a condiment and not a, not a dressing or a, that's the biggest, yeah. That's the. I think that's the biggest, you know, miscarriage of justice. And I think I'm. I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted to even <laughs> think. Disgusted. Well, okay. So think of it this way: if someone said, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some ketchup dressing," that's disgusting, <laughs> right? But that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm. I'm disappointed that I'm colloquially trained to react with disgust when thinking about ketchup dressing when it is literally the same thing. That's true. I'm. 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 I'm mad about this. <laughs> I blame the patriarchy. <laughs> it's just another example <laughs> of men putting their wretched hands all Clots. over something that they shouldn't be touching. <laughs> oh boy. Well, Let's think more about this, and we'll come back to it next week. This will just be our main topic for next week. <laughs> this is just the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> this will just be the main thing that we talk about next week. Now that the No Man's Sky discussion's over. <laughs> oh, ah, Techno Nico saying, then what the hell is butter? Uh, that's a great point. Because butter you spread on bread, but it's also a very important ingredient. Uh, that could be anything. Yeah, I can <laughs> <laughs> he says with with a, a gleam of wonder in his eyes. <laughs> oh, great! I wonder if my theory on butter is that it was a thing. It, it was an always an ingredient, right? Mm-hmm. It, it never. It, it's not to say that it isn't good. It's great. You spread or on bread or waffles or something. It's fantastic. It should have never been a spread or a condiment. And someone did it at one point, and it was probably really gross to everybody <laughs> who told about it. But and he managed it managed to catch on, and now we just accept it. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's great. It's delicious. What a time to be alive! We have all these options with our toppings. Yeah, it's like the first person to dip, and this is just in its you know, this is just in its heyday. It's just becoming like naturalized, uh, like the. Um, like pizza and ranch. Like some people, you ask, and they'll say that's gross, and then other people, they're they're on the uh, they're on board. That's I'm the next one big of thing. <laughs> I'm one of them. Oh, so you do you do you dip your pizza in ranch? Not always. It's been a while, but it it works. Okay, it's good. I'll keep that in mind. I just feel I already kind of feel gross every time I eat pizza, and I just think that that will exacerbate issues. Yeah, that's the thing is that when you have like veggies and you dip them in ranch or something, it's it's fine because it's like, well, I'm eating, I'm eating vegetables. It would be like more gross if I didn't dip it in ranch. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be weirder if I didn't dip it in ranch. <laughs> but pizza is already like unhealthy. <laughs> what a great oh, yeah, discussion. Just some, just eating some raw carrots. <laughs> yeah, nobody <laughs> likes that. The only people that do that are on on diets. And I don't know. Like some people will say they do, and I think they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. Ugh. All right, well that was a fun Good discussion. 
if you think more about it, let me know, because I'm like this is like a like a semi joke for the podcast, but I am partly also serious in how much I'm willing to contemplate and debate this topic. <laughs> so let me know. Awesome. Uh, so my goal is to get to 20 likes this week to hear more, <laughs> so that we can you know and and make sure you comment on whether you think ketchup, even though it's labeled as a condiment, could also be considered a dip. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. Right. Uh, all right. Any any closing statements? Closing words? Uncharted four, five out of five. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's like my favorite thing that's ever happened. I know that was great. Big bang, shooting guns, explosions, and trains falling. Five out of five. <laughs>